non-exercise activity thermogenesis is hands down the biggest lever that you can pull for fat loss. More than exercise, more than diet. It is the simple calories that you burn living life through activity. Your basic things that aren't exercise related, walking around, doing the dishes, fidgeting, these things matter. So how can we make non-exercise activity thermogenesis in the amount that we're already doing more effective? If your current activity throughout the day burns a thousand calories, how can we do the same amount of activity and have it burn 1200? I'm not talking about adding more things. I'm not saying go do the dishes to burn more calories. I'm saying, how do we do exactly what we're already doing, but get it to burn more so that we're not thinking about it? Because non-exercise activity thermogenesis is great because it's passive fat burning. It's passive energy expenditure. The first thing that you can do is put on one or two pounds of muscle. People do not realize that at rest, just at rest, a pound of muscle burns a lot of calories. You take that same pound of muscle and put it through movement and it starts burning exponentially more calories. So you think about if you put on a few pounds of muscle and you're sitting down, you're gonna automatically burn more calories. But if you put on a couple pounds of muscle and then you go through your same activity throughout the day, you're burning significantly more. You're doing the exact same thing except with a metabolically active weight vest on. So you don't feel like you're carrying more, but your body's revving up the systems. There was a cool study published in the journal Obesity that took a look at uh, resistance training versus aerobic training versus no training at all. Interestingly enough, they found that aerobic training decreased fat-free mass, so it decreased like some of the uh, things that aren't fat, not always good, uh, and actually decreased resting energy expenditure. But then when they looked at resistance training, they found that resistance training not only maintained fat-free mass, maintained muscle, but it increased resting energy expenditure. Now, I love cardio and I love my aerobic training. So I'm not saying do resistance training instead of cardio. But my point in saying this is that, simply put, resistance training increases your fat-free mass and increases your resting energy expenditure. I know that one's kind of basic. Let's go ahead and move on to the next one, which is probably the most powerful one, and it requires a little bit of school. So class is in session with this one. Check it out. It's called G-Flux and I'm gonna explain it probably better than I've ever explained it in other videos before. Eat more and move more. Eating more is going to actually make your non-exercise activity thermogenesis better. How is that the case? Shouldn't it be eat less and move more? Well, from a basic energy balance standpoint, yes but we're not talking about energy balance. You see, energy flux or G flux is the number of calories moving through a system. In this case, your body. It's the total number of calories moving through. Whereas energy balance is the difference or the delta between your calories in and your calories out. So energy flux is the rate of your intake, the rate of your expenditure, and sometimes the rate of your storage. So let's explain it like this. If you have 10,000 calories moving through a system, 10,000 calories in, 10,000 calories out, that is a high flux. It's a high amount of energy moving through a system, okay? If you have 1,000 calories coming in and 1,000 calories coming out, it's the same net-net, right? But it's a lot less calories, a lot less energy moving through a system. Why does this matter? Because the amount of energy moving through a system matters for your overall energy flux and fat loss. Look at it like this. If you consumed 10,000 calories and burned 10,000 calories, if you have a slight surplus, it's going to be such a small blip on the radar in the grand scheme of things because you have so much energy moving through, it's gonna barely make a dent in your body composition. So if, if I eat 10,000 calories and burn 10,000 calories, but I accidentally eat an extra 500, as a percentage, it's such a small amount of the total energy that it's probably not gonna impact me much. My metabolism's running so hot, it's just, I don't know, it's almost erroneous, right? But if I am only eating 1,000 calories and burning 1,000 calories, that same 500 calorie surplus is now a big deal. It's a, it's a large percentage of my overall flux, of my overall energy moving through a system. 
So we want more energy moving through a system. We want to eat more and we want to move more. And naturally, especially based upon what's called the constrained energy theory or energy model, the more you eat, the more even subconsciously you're going to move. But it doesn't mean you just go to McDonald's. I mean, you strategically do this, right? I recommend slightly increasing your calories and slightly increasing your movement consciously. Not big things, not giant levers, just little teeny smidgets here until you start to feel like, okay, hey, yeah, my metabolism is changing. It can course correct. And it's gonna be the single biggest thing that you can do to get more out of everyday movement because everyday movement is now burning hotter versus everyday movement being like this conserved little precious efficient system. Number three, the macronutrients that you consume. Yep, believe it or not, whether you consume carbs or fats does seem to make a little bit of a lick of a difference. There was a study published in the International Society of Sports Nutrition. It had people resistance train and then they took a look at their dietary intake. What they found is that when people consumed carbohydrates, carbohydrates seem to be inversely correlated at all time periods measured with resting energy expenditure. In other words, consuming carbs actually slowed down the resting energy expenditure. It slowed down the metabolic rate, whereas actually consuming more than 35% of the calories from fats seemed to increase the resting energy expenditure. Now, that being said, if you consume carbs and you get energy and you wanna move more, then theoretically you could be getting more out of carbs. But I think from a sheer digestive standpoint and also just from fat oxidation, skewing towards fats might be a little bit better. Now, again, everyone's gonna have a heyday with this one and it comes down to splitting hairs really. Like what is your preferred fuel source? What's gonna make you want to move more? Because that's what really matters at the end of the day. But I found this science intriguing. Bottom line is based upon this study, it seems that carbs may somewhat turn down energy, may somewhat turn down at least fat oxidation. But again, a lot of room for sort of negotiation there. Here's what's really interesting though. Even our microbiome can play a role in how we utilize fuels and how that translates into our activity. For example, if we have higher amounts of short chain fatty acids from a healthy microbiome, that influences carb oxidation, that influences fat oxidation, and it makes us more efficient at using the fuel. So if you eat food and you're not actually getting the fuel from it and it's not getting to the cells, you're not gonna to wanna to move as much, just even subconsciously. But if things are moving right and the carbs are able to be utilized and the fat is able to be utilized and you have good oxidation rates of both, depending on the energy that you're expending, well then heck yeah, that means things are working. So I think one of the biggest ways is to start with our gut health. We just don't always think about it because it seems so far removed from the basic energy balance and energy flux systems of our metabolism but it really is kind of the core of it. I think that paying attention to gut health is really, really important. Fermented dairy, things like fermented meat even, sauerkraut, kimchi, fair bit of fiber, usually coming from like flax or chia. These things do make a difference. Also a probiotic when it makes sense. I put a link for the probiotic I use, talk about them all the time, so it's probably no surprise. It's called Seed. That's a 25% off discount link, by the way, since people ask all the time. So a huge discount that they've given people that watch my channel. It's a symbiotic, which means it has a prebiotic and a probiotic. That's why when you look at it, there's a capsule inside a capsule. So it's two capsules in one for a sort of a multi-stage. So you have like the prebiotic that sort of breaks down first, the outer shell, and then as the other capsule that's inside travels down the system more, that sort of colonizes properly, so to speak. So it kind of disseminates where it needs to go. So basically you have this multi-stage delivery, which is a unique thing for them, which is why they are who they are. Honestly, that's really what put them on the map. But then in their clinical research that they've done is what's really interesting. That goes into a whole bunch of different categories outside of just fat loss and glucose metabolism. But anyhow, definitely recommend it. I think you notice it pretty quick. And if you're trying to make a change, it's probably an important lever to pull. So link top line of the description. In the way of macronutrients though, we do need to talk about one that's going to sound painfully obvious, but I'm talking about protein and I'm not talking about it from the thermic effect. We're talking about non-exercise activity thermogenesis here, which means digestive thermic effect of protein is very valid, but it's a moot point in today's video. Yes, you consume protein, you can burn 20 to 35% of calories just from the protein itself, but that has nothing to do with meat. With non-exercise activity thermogenesis, protein alone will maintain your muscle. There was a study published in obesity that looked at dismally low levels of protein, 79 grams of protein versus 58 grams of protein per day. I consider that dismally low. 
the 79 grams of protein group ended up maintaining twice as much muscle as the 58 gram group. What that tells us is that even marginally more protein is gonna maintain your muscle. And remember what I said at the beginning of this video, the more muscle you have, the more calories you're gonna burn doing dishes. Next, if we can consciously break up sedentary behavior. I have to mention this because the math is just too strong to ignore. The International Journal of Behavioral Nutrition and Physical Activity had subjects do four 30 minute bouts of sedentary activity. And they divided them into these groups, okay? They had a one group do no standing at all. They had one group get up for one minute, another group get up for uh, two minutes, excuse me, and another group get up for five minutes in these 30 minute bouts. Okay, what they found is that the one minute activity group, the group that just got up from sitting down for one minute, ended up burning an extra three calories. The group that got up for two minutes burned 7.4 calories, and the group that got up for five minutes burned 16.5 calories in that 30 minute window. Now, when they kind of extrapolate that over the course of the day, basically the people that got up for one minute burned 24 calories. People that got up for two minutes burned 59 calories. The people that got up for five minutes burned 132 calories more per day. You start doing the math on this, and it's pretty crazy. Literally just getting up and walking at a regular pace, just pacing, moseying around, doing nothing, self-selected pace. It wasn't like prescribed, just, hey, just get up and move around a little bit. Five minutes, they burned that much more. We're talking a pound per month plus just by doing that. Next one is fairly obvious, but it is important to mention. There was a study published in Scientific Reports that demonstrated that when people were even remotely sleep deprived, just moderately sleep deprived, like one to two hours, their resting energy expenditure went down, their resting metabolic rate went down, and their overall fat oxidation went down. So our body, think about it, when we're tired, when we haven't been sleeping, we conserve. We do everything we can to conserve because okay, this is stressful, and we also don't have a lot of energy to operate all these other systems, so let's down-regulate. So you simply move less, you probably just burn less at rest, and you're oxidizing less fat because your body says, let's keep it just in case. Number seven is one of my favorite ones, and you're gonna really like this one. And some people are gonna hate it. Drink coffee. Caffeine is good for non-exercise activity thermogenesis. I don't think it's amazing to do all the time, but actually, yeah, it is, but just maybe not up to your sleep. You ever have caffeine and it makes you fidget? You know what one of the strongest things about need is? Is fidgeting. Fidgeting burns calories. Simply moving, ah, da, 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 just ah, being crazy, shaking your leg, whatever, bouncing your leg. Caffeine can do this. Now, caveat, previously I mentioned sleep. There is also a newer study that demonstrates that if you have caffeine past like even 12 hours before you go to sleep, it can have an impact, right, on your sleep and sleep is gonna be important, so where do you draw the line? For me, I say about eight hours before bed. I will load up on caffeine up until about eight hours before bed. Personally, I'm a green tea and yerba mate kind of guy. The evidence is there, again, take it or leave it. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. I'll see you tomorrow.